people like me. You need people like me so you can point your fingers and say that's the bad guy. Fighting Katie Taylor, who do you fight next? Um, making the money I, I'm making with Katie Taylor. Who is going to give me that amount of money again? So it's, um, I, I see myself another year. I'm hoping to one day step in your shoes and become a WWE star. Oh, like let's that. go. Let's go, dude. So that, that's something That's something I, I'm looking uh, looking forward to. I, I've trained a little bit with, uh, with Amazing Red. So, I mean, I, I dabbled in um, in wrestling. I trained a couple of days, so that was pretty cool. You heard Amanda's question. Beyond the Katie Taylor fight, whatever happens. Win or lose. Where else is she going to get that kind of money, that kind of scratch, that kind of cash? This is a career-high purse for Amanda Serrano. She's given herself another year. We know that McLayla Mayer stated that she'd be willing to move up in weight for the winner of that fight. Oh, even the loser would be a high-profile fight for Michaela. But make no mistake, it's the winner that she has in mind. And if the winner by some chance were Amanda, that could prove a very expensive proposition for top rank because I'm of the opinion that Amandia Serrano would require at least seven figures to set foot in the ring with a risky opponent, a unified champion like a Michaela Mayer, even if Michaela were traveling north to the super featherweight division for that fight. Amanda mentioned going over to the WWE. Not questioning Amanda's character or her drive, her willingness to win. I just think she's motivated by different aspects of this fight than perhaps Katie Taylor is because Katie was already making very good money. The most for any woman boxer at this time. She wanted this fight for the glory, it seems. Katie did because she was already making very good money without this fight. And I think the story is she's been making seven figures of fight ever since the Persoon fight. Whereas Amandia, she was making substantially less, even under contract with Matchroom and even under contract with Jake Paul. I believe this will be the first time Amanda Serrano rakes in a seven-figure purse, a seven-figure payday. I think she's been making six figures of fight for a while now. Though not north of 500000 below it. Oh. Now, I'm not surprised to hear that Amandia is thinking of doing other things beyond the Taylor fight. Where is she? If Amandia were to win the fight, in order for her to have an extended stay in the sport of boxing... Stick around. She'd need major backing so that she could get paid the way that she wants to get paid. A deal with a major promoter, a major platform that makes it worth her while to get back out there and defend either those lightweight titles she potentially lifts off Katie Taylor or the featherweight titles she will still be holding if she loses. Because she's still got two belts at 126 pounds regardless of the outcome. Now maybe such a deal can be orchestrated by way of most valuable promotions. I don't know. Maybe they can situate something with her on Showtime. Maybe Amandia Serrano will make a return to the DAZN platform by way of Matchroom. Either way, I get the sense that if Amanda were to win the fight, for her to stay in the sport even longer, moving forward, she would need a major deal with somebody that can pay her major scratch, major cash. Because for Amanda, I think that's what it's all about. Make of that what you will. When Katie Taylor first pursued Amanda Serrano, and Amanda was first made that matchroom deal, that three-fight deal that was intended to cap off with a Katie Taylor fight, a Katie Taylor showdown. Amanda herself... You know that before Amanda was made that deal, she said 2018 was going to be her last year in the sport of boxing? What she said ahead of the Yamila Reynoso fight at 140 pounds for a then-vacant WBO title. That's what Amanda stated. That 2018, win or lose, regardless of what happened, would be her last year in the sport of boxing. It was that three Three fight deal. It was that three fight matchroom deal that influenced her to stick around? And the promise of a Katie Taylor fight, a Katie Taylor showdown, a Katie Taylor payday, I should say, since I think both fighters are motivated in different ways for different reasons. Amanda's a prize fighter, and there's nothing wrong with placing emphasis on the prize. There isn't, but when it comes to Amanda, I do.
do believe that's the focus. I do believe that that's really what it's all about for her. If she would have beat Katie, there's still a lot of good fights out there for her. Several financial opportunities, though, none of them as lucrative as the Taylor fight. And that's why she's only given herself another year. Thinking about going to the WWE, all that jazz. I do firmly believe that both the fighters are motivated by different aspects of this showdown on Saturday night at Madison Square Garden. I do believe that the driving force behind each fighter's intent is different. For Amanda, it's the money, and for Katie, it's the glory. I've always felt that Katie Taylor wanted this fight just a little more than Amanda did, because when Katie hit the scene, Amanda was the one making a decision to bow out. It was Katie's people that reached out to Amanda. It was Katie's people that, after having reached out, pulled Amanda back in. It was Amanda Serrano that said, there are other fights out there for her with other girls. She doesn't necessarily need Katie Taylor, whereas Katie Taylor... You've been paying attention. She's always wanted this fight. She made that crystal clear. Been pursuing it for years. Well, does any of that have any bearing on performance? It's not to be overstated, though at minimum, it could. He wants it more. But it's not to be overstated. In the end, it will be the boxing that decides who the better boxer is and the preparation. That'll tell the story. To whom it may concern, that is how we got here. How we got to this point. To where we're finally on the eve of this fight. It took a lot of time and a lot of money to get Amanda Serrano on board for this showdown, this mega fight. Yeah, I do think money is the main focus for Amanda. More than several other elements and other aspects of the fight, I think what's really motivating Amanda here is the payday, and you can make of that what you will. Most people view the fight as a 50-50 fight. Pick who you like. Based on the aforementioned factors and sound bites and available information, or... Disregard it altogether. Either way, it's an excellent fucking fight. I've been looking forward to it for a long time, and... We're gonna find out what's what on Saturday. In men's heavyweight news, on the heels of his loss this past weekend to Tyson Fury, Dillian White says, When the uppercut landed, I was buzzed. But he full-on pushed me. I fell over and hit my head on the canvas, which is illegal. But as usual, they let Tyson Fury do whatever he wants and get away with it. I should have been allowed extra time to recover. And it is true. After landing that right uppercut that Dillian White didn't see coming, he was shoved by Tyson Fury. Dillian lost his footing. It really looked like his head hit the canvas, though that's what he's alleging took place after losing his footing. No, I don't think very many people want to die on a hill over this thing. Even guys like me that were rooting for Dillian and wouldn't have minded it one bit if he were able to upset the apple cart or at least really give it a go and make Tyson Fury work for it. Even guys like me don't want to die on a hell over this thing because what you have to ask yourself is, had Dillian White been allowed the time? If he would have been allowed that time he's asking for to recuperate. Bear in mind, when he returned to his feet, he could barely walk. I don't get the sense that was due to the fall. I get the sense that was due to the uppercut. He was clearly off balance. His equilibrium was clearly off. He was on Queer Street, spaghetti legs, whatever you want to call it. Dillian didn't have his wits about him when he returned to his feet, and he could barely come forward without staggering. But let's just say for argument's sake that the ref, Mark Lyson, nice, allows nice, him nice. the allotted time he wanted to regain his faculties. What do you really think would have happened after that? Did you guys get the sense he was on a voyage of turning things around? Yeah, two of the three judges, they had Tyson Fury up by a wide margin. I myself had Dillian White down four rounds, four rounds to one in favor of... Tyson Fury. Not unsympathetic, I'm just being honest. I don't imagine this whole illegal push fiasco gets off the ground to where people are shaking their fists at the sky demanding that Tyson Fury give Dillian Vite a rematch. I don't imagine there are many people out there right now that are willing to die arguing on a hill in favor of what Dillian White is saying because he was so clearly out of it and I don't think that was as a result of the fall. I think that was as a result of the uppercut. It's the uppercut that jostled his brain shook his equilibrium and had him on Queer Street. It's the uppercut for me that put him out, even if it was the shove that put him down. Take away the shove. He's a guy who's out on his feet. Take Tyson Fury shoving Dillian Veidt out of the equation, and Dillian Veidt would have just been a guy who's out on his feet, likely would have sustained more punishment that would have caused him to collapse. So, in any event... He got knocked out. I'm not unsympathetic. I feel for the guy. He even raises a valid point. Tyson Fury's biggest supporters, the guy singing his praises, they won't make light of Tyson Fury shoving Dillian White to the ground, but that's likely why. Dillian looked like he was out of the fight. Certainly wasn't a fight he was winning. He wants a rematch. That's what he's saying now. Dillian White was quoted as saying, he said, he being Tyson Fury, he says, he says, he said he'll retire 
I hope he doesn't retire, because I want another go. Yo, Tyson Fury, he had two fights with John McDermott. He needed two fights with that guy in order to gain one decisive victory. Something similar applies to the Derek Chisoria fight and the Deontay Wilder fights. He had to fight Deontay Wilder two times before he could rack up an official... An official victory, even though most people feel he won the first fight. And all three of those guys that saw Tyson Fury more than once... They had more success against him than Dillian Veidt did. So from where I'm sitting, it's safe to say that Dillian Veidt likely won't get another crack at Tyson Fury. He's got to move on. I don't think Dillian Veidt is as much an ego guy as Deontay Wilder was. Being honest with you, I think Dillian White can rebound. I don't think it is quite as psychologically damaging to Dillian having lost this fight the way he lost this fight. I don't think it's as damaging to him as it was to Deontay Wilder. I feel like Deontay Wilder, he, he just can never go back to being the same guy that he was. Whereas Dillian, ahead of this fight... He suffered losses before. He was the kind of guy to where people are just blowing smoke up his ass and, and he doesn't realize what he's up against. I, I think he did. Call me crazy. I kind of think Dillian's more of a realist than Deontay was. And the reason for that are the circumstances. Initially, when Deontay Wilder fought Tyson Fury for the first time, ahead of that fight, Tyson wasn't even known as a puncher. He was viewed as a feather-fisted guy whose bread and butter really is his movement and his boxing, his agility for a man his size. Everything backfired for Deontay Wilder from then on. There's still people out there they don't like to admit that Tyson Fury was a cherry pick gone wrong. That's what he was. A morbidly obese man on the rebound from weight loss and cocaine addiction. A fighter who had not faced another world-class boxer in some years. The Sefer Seferi fight, the Francesco Pianetta fight. Glorified sparring session. I think Wilder's losses to Tyson Fury, his hands, hit him harder than Dillian Veidt's knockout loss to Tyson Fury this past weekend because for Deontay Wilder, he was the architect of his own destruction. He chose that for himself instead of the Joshua fight. It's not hard to see what the plan was. Let's beat Tyson Fury. Let's add to our profile, add to our marquee value by beating one of the UK's top guys who still has an unbeaten record, who still has his O intact and a claim towards being this division's lineal champion. Let's take care of that guy and maybe we come back to the table with the Anthony Joshua people. Why the fuck else would he have given Fury a voluntary title shot? What do you really think that was all about? You think about how that fight performed commercially. A little over 300,000 pay-per-views sold at the box office office not a monumental gate there was actually more money on the table for him with anthony joshua what all of this was for wilder was a leverage tactic that backfired and that's why i think his losses to fury hit him harder than dillian white's loss to fury this past weekend dillian white can rebound and believe it or not he's got options he keep doing business with frank if he wants maybe he fights joe joyce if joe joyce makes his way past joseph parker maybe he fights daniel dubois if daniel makes his way past trevor bryant or maybe don king makes things difficult and the bryant fight don't happen for dubois he's gonna need a dance partner dillian is still a serviceable fighter a serviceable heavyweight maybe he deals with those guys maybe he goes over the sky they're in need of some familiar faces, some heavyweights. Huey Fury's over there. Maybe he takes on Huey and lets Huey have it for what Tyson did. There's still a lot of money out there for Dillian White. And a lot of fights. He could always go back to Matchroom and continue doing business with them on a fight-by-fight -fight basis. He has options, though as far as a Fury rematch, I don't anticipate that happens. Nevertheless, Dillian hopes Tyson Fury doesn't retire. So he wants a rematch. Well, Eddie Hearn says... Tyson Fury is very popular at the moment, so anything you say negative about him isn't going to go down very well. But Tyson Fury's a great bluff merchant. He ain't retiring. The biggest fights for Tyson Fury haven't even happened yet. This was supposed to be his last fight on the top rank. I think that's worth mentioning. It is. So if he were to return to the sport, would he return as a top rank fighter? Would he continue to work with them? I do get the sense he'd continue to work with Frank. Maybe he'd continue to work with Bob, maybe. As stated, this was supposed to be his last fight under his existing top rank contract. And I still think whether or not he returns is all based around who wins Joshua versus Usyk 2. Joshua versus Usyk 2 that Eddie Hearn confirms 
July 23rd is the front running date for that rematch. The end of July. I know, I know. It feels like it's taking them forever to get this fight over the line. But it is worth noting that Oleksandr Yusik only recently left war torn Ukraine. There was a point where we didn't even know if the rematch would take place and Anthony Joshua might have to end up fighting someone else. I mean, that is worth considering. There was a delay. There were unforeseen circumstances. That has its role to play and why it's taken them so long to get this fight over the line. Eddie Hearn says they have final negotiations with sites in the Middle East and the United Kingdom. The Middle East would be neutral territory for both combatants, both fighters, but you don't get the sense they try to screw Usyk on the cards because when he beat Anthony Joshua in their first fight, it was in the UK. If they wanted to screw Usyk, they would have screwed him then. Granted that he made it very hard for them to do that, better still, Anthony Joshua's had home field advantage didn't stop Oleksandr Usyk from beating him. You have to wonder which direction Eddie Hearn is going to go. There might be more money in it for him and the fighters, the event in the Middle East, but if he wants to one-up his old buddy Frank Warren and the supposed 94,000 in attendance for Fury versus Vite, he can do that Joshua fight in the UK. We'll see who the bigger draw really is. Who does better at the box office and who puts more asses in more seats. Not that it should matter anyway because Tyson Fury is supposed to be retiring, right? Right. Tyson Fury, who just satisfied his mandatory challenger in Dillian Vite, leaving the way clear for him to hang on to that WBC title without any pesky mandates, any mandatories. He's already taken care of that. The WBC will allow him all the time he wants, all the time he needs to make his final decision as to whether or not he wants to come back as a champion or relinquish the belt and go into retirement. He won't receive any pressure from them. The fight with Anthony Joshua and Oleksandr Yusik is supposed to be going down in late July. If news breaks before then that Tyson Fury has relinquished the WBC title, then I guess we can take him seriously. He really is retiring. He's not kidding around. Yeah, if that's what happens. If that news don't break and you notice that Tyson Fury is still registered as the WBC's heavyweight champion in late July, right around the time that this fight is supposed to go down, you can interpret that as a sign that Tyson Fury's got his eyes on this fight. He wants to know who's going to win, and he'll consider, at least consider coming back for the winner. If he don't vacate the title before that. Because if the guy's really done, then the guy's really done. If you ain't got no intention of coming back, there ain't no reason you should still be hanging on to that title and that status, the status of a WBC champion. So if July 23rd rolls around, this guy still's got the belt. It's because this guy's thinking about coming back. And if this guy still got that belt, July 23rd, or later on in the month, by the time this fight goes down, if the winner emerges and Tyson Fury still got that belt, the winner of that fight is going to be looking for him, whether it's Yusick or Anthony Joshua. We'll see if there's any truth to the retirement talks, because he has options. Another stint on the WWE crossover MMA boxing match with Francis Ngannou. He does have options, lucrative ones. Midsummer is the time frame. Time frame for this rematch, and if Midsummer gets here, you know what time it is. If he's still got that belt, you know what it means. We'll see if he's a bluff merchant. He vacates it beforehand, you know what that means also. You know what that means as well. The WBC is going to give this guy plenty of time with that title, plenty of time with that belt, plenty of time to make a decision.